as we move into November, we want to focus during our times together, especially in worship, on the idea of service. Now, we often talk about service, for we understand it is one of the ways and one of the primary ways we demonstrate the following of our marching, marching orders to love God and love others. For as we engage in service to other people in the name of Jesus, we are demonstrating our love for Christ and through Christ for our Heavenly Father, and also our love for people as we reach out to them in Jesus' name. Attempting to consider cases of those who engage in service, sometimes in uh, unique situations or situations we don't always expect uh, to find ourselves in. Uh, I've chosen this week to uh, look at the story of Esther. It may not be a story that you've often read, or perhaps you've never read it. It's an Old Testament uh, book, and it uh, holds interest for both uh, Old Testament and New Testament commentators. But the story of Esther um, catches us in some significant ways, and I want to talk about that in a few minutes. But um, our focus for the week is from Esther chapter 4. I'm really, let me read a little bit of that. That captures the uh, tension and the beginning of the resolution of the tension. The tension centers around the fact that uh, the Jewish people, um, Esther was Jewish, the Jewish people were under threat of destruction within the uh, confines of the Persian Empire. The story takes place well after the exile of the Jewish people from their homeland, and now living in various parts of the empire uh, because of uh, conflict between uh, Esther's cousin, or older cousin apparently, who had reared her because her parents had died, the conflict between that cousin and a member of the Persian king's ruling court, the Jews were under threat of destruction. We'll have to read the whole book to get that whole story. But in the midst of that conflict, Esther, who has risen to the place of queen uh, alongside the Persian king, we know him by his Greek name of Xerxes, um, she finds herself in the position of possibly being able to come to the aid of her people. And that's the context for the setting of today's scripture. I begin reading in Esther 4, beginning with verse 8. Mordecai, that's her, her cousin who adopted her, who filled the role of father during her rearing. Mordecai gave uh, him, we'll see who him was in a minute, gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, their, the Jews' destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with the king on behalf of her people. And Hathak, the, the representative of uh, Esther, who was the intermediary between Esther and Mordecai. Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. 
Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Uh, this book, not a lengthy uh, book, 10 chapters, the last chapter very brief, but still it is longer than our time will permit us to uh, read together. But let me give you a brief synopsis of the whole book. Uh, this one is found in the Layman's Bible Commentary, uh, an older book in my library dating back to the 19th. Uh, 60s, but older is not always bad. Um, it gives us a, a summary of what we would find if we read through this whole uh, Old Testament book. Uh, this book tells the story of the rise of a Hebrew maiden to the position of queen of Persia. By Esther's influence, a plot against the Jews is turned against their enemies. The victories of the Jews is the victory of the Jews is celebrated in a day or two days of general rejoicing. The story is told as the interplay of political, sociological, and personal factors with no overt reference to God and no direct suggestion that the religious factors of faith, prayer, and the like played any significant part in the movement of events. This is part of the uh, intrigue of the book of Esther. Uh, there are no direct references to God in this whole book. Uh, that has caused both Old Testament Jewish scholars as well as New Testament Christian scholars to, in examining the book, to come to some interesting conclusions and often conclusions that are odds with others uh, of their colleagues. Some see the book and both Jewish and Christian uh, scholars, some look at Esther and say it has no place in the Bible. It does not refer to uh, religious things. It is more uh, secular than sacred. Others find in it a significant, a significant teaching for us to understand the providence of God and the providence of God overarching the events that are found within the book, though God is not specifically mentioned. We do find two references, and you hear them in the reading uh, that I did from chapter four, uh, two um, references that seem to, if we're reading this from a faith perspective, and we are, uh, two references that seem to allude uh, to the action of God, though it is not spelled out specifically. Uh, one is when Mordecai sends word to Esther uh, for her to go into the king and plead for her people, plead that they be spared. Uh, Mordecai says to her, um, it is, here's how it reads in verse 14, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Uh, the implication is that God has placed you there. Again, if you're reading this from a faith perspective, God has placed you there for this purpose, uh, to be an instrument of salvation for your people. And then Esther, uh, acquiescing to her father figure, her cousin's instruction, okay, I'll do this, beginning of verse 16, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and for three days. And then she, in that later in that verse, she says, I and my attendants, she was the queen, I and my attendants will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though is it against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So she calls for a fast among the Jews that she could gather and among her own attendants. She doesn't mention anything other than fasting, though we know from the culture, uh, the Jewish culture, that fasting and prayers would usually go together. But prayers are not mentioned here. But these are the only two places within the book that 
Um, you find even an uh, a, a passing uh, reference to uh, the action of God or the interaction of God uh, with the people who are the primary characters in the story. However, and I won't spend a lot of time with this, there are many uh, writers uh, and Old Testament scholars who look at this book and find woven throughout the entire book um, the ideas of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, the Proverbs, for instance. Over and again, the things that the Proverbs teach us, though in the Proverbs there are often direct references to God, but the, the wisdom that is taught through the Proverbs uh, is woven throughout the, all the details of these, at least chapters one through nine. And so as you read through this book, and I hope you will, it's not a, a lengthy read, but consider how you can find some of the wisdom from the Proverbs. And if you're willing to take on the task of uh, such a study, uh, I'll be glad to share some uh, references with you that will uh, help you make those uh, connections. But for the rest of our time today, let me just briefly uh, look at some principles and some lessons that maybe will be helpful for us as we examine this ancient uh, writing. Um, what we find here is uh, in throughout the, the book uh, is a, a case study uh, specifically, specifically of Jews living in a Gentile, non Jewish world. Uh, Esther, Mordecai, all the Jews that they know and beyond are not living in the Palestinian region. They're not living uh, in Israel. They don't have access to Jerusalem, to the temple. They are completely immersed in the uh, Gentile world of the Persian Empire. Uh, the Jewish people, many of them, especially the uh, upper class people, the, the leaders, the religious and political leaders had been exiled from Israel many years uh, prior to the incidents that are described in this book. And in fact, there's some uh, confusion about dating all of this because of uh, some of the names that appear. Again, you'll have to do some of your own study on that. But these people were living not in the, the comfort of their own culture, but they were living in many cases, uh, certainly in Esther's case, they were living as virtual captives uh, within the Gentile world. And so we could ask the question for us in, as 21st century Christians, can we learn anything in this book about how to live successfully, how to live effectively as the people of God in a culture that is not focused on the God we serve? Uh, most of us, likely all of us, would agree that our culture does not overwhelmingly share our God-centered values. Uh, certainly, our culture still uses a lot of God language often, uh, and you will find uh, references perhaps to spirituality or to religion or even sometimes to the Bible. Uh, but there is overwhelming evidence uh, that the majority of people in our nation do not share our uh, spiritual values, our biblically based values. Again, they may use language that would suggest that, but many people who use the term Christian, many that use the term evangelical, mean those terms much more in political or social uh, terms than they do in living out their Christian faith, living out their evangelical and evangelistic faith as we find prescribed in the pages of Scripture. So how do we live successfully 
and effectively as the people of God in a culture that's not focused on the God we serve. Well, how does the story of Esther and her cousin Mordecai help us respond to that question, how to live successfully or effectively as the people of God in a culture not focused on God? Well, one aspect of that answer is that we can be effective as we understand the culture in which we live. Understanding is not the same as embracing it or accepting it in the sense of living like it, but understanding the culture in which we live suggests that we learn the language of learn what the culture understands about itself, how it sees itself, how it operates. Uh, the story of Esther uh, is filled uh, with details about life in the Persian culture and life in the Persian royal uh, structure. Uh, many details, the banquets that are described in this, this book is filled with uh, references to and information about banquets uh, around the king and around the king's culture. And so there's obviously on the part of the writer of, of Esther or writers, perhaps uh, we don't know anything about who put it together, uh, but the person or persons who did put it together obviously understood the Persian culture. You cannot communicate with people if you don't know their language and their culture. So if we want to be successful in living out our evangelical values, that is in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with our non-God focused culture, then we've got to understand that culture in the sense of at least knowing how to talk to that culture, understanding their language and how people view the world so that we can communicate with them. Again, understanding does not mean agree agreeing with or embracing the values of the culture, but understanding the language, just as when people leave here and go to other uh, places on, in the world, uh, as missionaries, one of the first things they must do is learn the language and begin to understand the culture of the people with whom they're working. For without those understandings, they will not be successful in communicating uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. A second thing we see in answering the question, living how to live effectively as the people of God in a culture not focused on the God we serve, is we learn from Esther and Mordecai how to work within that system without violating your own values. Um, now, these were Mordecai and Esther uh, were people with great limitations because they were not Persians, uh, but they, because they learned to communicate, because they learned their culture, they were able to work within their system, but without violating their own values. Uh, another thing they did was they took advantage of openings. Uh, Mordecai and Esther were mindful of opportunities uh, to advance the cause of their people. And when they had those opportunities, they reacted positively to them. Uh, they did not push necessarily, though Esther did at one point in going into the king, even though he had not called for her, but they looked for opportunities and as they saw those opportunities, they took advantage of them. Something else they did was they sought wisdom. Um, Esther, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail Sunday, uh, Esther listened to her, her cousin, Mordecai. Uh, she sought his wisdom. How do I do the things I need to do? How, what, what's going on? What's wrong? Uh, how can I respond to that? Uh, she sought wisdom, and she also obeyed wisdom. Uh, this was not just the wisdom of Mordecai, but again, if we see the influence of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, we see, for instance, that she was very patient uh, in 
carrying out the plan or, or the, the desire uh, to save her people from destruction. There were also times when she was, uh, she did not rush into speaking uh, in the, uh, in her approach to the king. She was very slow and deliberate about making him aware of what the problem was and what needed to be done about it. She did not rush into that. Wisdom said, sometimes you take your time. Uh, wisdom says that sometimes you, you don't speak uh, and you certainly don't speak until it's time to speak. Something else we see, and this is perhaps one of the most significant aspects of her life, is we see that for Esther, in order to be successful, uh, living as a part of the people of God uh, in a culture not focused on the things of God, Esther was willing to risk, to take a risk in order to be faithful to her people and in order to uh, save her people. She was willing to risk even, she was willing to risk her life in order to do the right thing. Uh, that's not being overly dramatic because as we read in this story, she knew just going to the king without specifically being invited into his presence uh, could very easily or and very likely lead to her death. And so she was willing to risk uh, that almost certain death, death in order to do what she could do. The only pathway she had to uh, saving her people was to get the king involved uh, in overturning a decision that had already been made. Uh, we see also here, and this is not necessarily the main part of the story, but certainly in the beginning, the first chapter, we see the danger of drunkenness. Uh, the, the reason Esther had been elevated king or had found herself as the queen, uh, the Persian queen to uh, the king of Persia, was because in the first chapter, uh, we see the Persian king uh, well into the uh, latter parts of a great banquet, a banquet that was filled with much drinking. The language there is that the uh, the people were encouraged to drink as much as they want. The uh, king was attempting to show his wealth and the splendor of his uh, reign. And in one of the ways to do that was to provide an abundance or even an overabundance of, of wine. And so the people were encouraged to drink and the language suggests that uh, there was no limits. They were told to drink however they chose to drink. In other words, as much as they wanted. And so apparently the king uh, was willing to do the same thing. And because of the lack of restraint uh, that that would have created, he put his uh, queen, not Esther, but Vashti, he put her, his queen into a very difficult situation and she pushed back against it. Uh, and you'll need to read chapter one, but you'll find that uh, the king and surrounded by advisors who may have been um, intoxicated themselves, uh, reacted in a very immature and overreaction uh, to her desire not to be paraded around in front of a bunch of drunks. Uh, in their overreaction, she found herself demoted and uh, no longer uh, able to uh, be seen as the queen. She was not killed, but she was sent back into uh, the harem never to come into the presence of the king again. Of course, the irony is in that story there, uh, she didn't want to be in the king's presence. Uh, he was asking her to do something in his presence she didn't want to do. And so their overreaction, the result for her was she got what she was wanting anyway. The final thing to look at here is we think about how to live effectively as the people of God in a culture not focused on the things of God, is we see in this story uh, significant uh, 
or uh, several times, we see a reversal of, shall we say, a reversal uh, of, of fortune. We see with Esther, uh, an orphan, uh, a, a child growing up as a, a Jew uh, within the Gentile culture, uh, we see this young girl who did not have um, any reason to think of a, a significant future. We see her fortunes reversed and finding herself as the queen uh, of the Persian Empire. We see in Mordecai uh, a man that was uh, his political enemy planned for him to be hanged on a a very high scaffolding. Uh, and um, we see instead of Mordecai being hanged on it, uh, his political enemy who had built uh, the place for his hanging, we see his political enemy Haman uh, being hanged on uh, the public display that he had, that Haman himself had had built. So a reversal of fortune. We see the Jews who had been um, slated for destruction because of the hatred of Haman. If you read the last few chapters of the book, you see that their fortunes are reversed, and instead of them being destroyed, uh, their uh, enemies within the empire were destroyed. And that points to a biblical concept for me uh, of, of repentance. That is what repentance is. It is a reversal uh, of our direction in life. Uh, we are going away from God, and repentance suggests uh, that we turn back toward God. And so we find even in this story that doesn't specifically mention God, we see uh, an action uh, on several occasions or actions several times that shows us the reversal uh, of things uh, that were meant for harm or that should have resulted in harm, we see a reversal that turn out for good uh, for the Jewish people who, who were understood as the people of God. So read this book. Uh, again, it's not a lengthy read. Uh, it is a uh, if you want to read it, first of all, as history, uh, certainly read it as uh, being interwoven with the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, uh, and then with a and read it uh, looking at the story of a, a very brave and resourceful uh, woman uh, that God used to uh, save his people in that particular uh, situation. Sunday, we'll look at this passage uh, from Esther chapter four in more detail uh, and see how this woman was able to serve her people uh, even in the midst of great difficulty. But until then, uh, just be reading and studying this and see how you see uh, the hand of God involved in the lives of these people, even if the name of God is not mentioned uh, throughout the book. Before we uh, conclude our time together today, I'd like to spend some time with you in prayer for our uh, church family and for the needs of the family as they've been brought to us. I'll put the, uh, as soon as I can figure out how to do so, I'll put our uh, prayer list in front of you so that you can use this uh, as I'm praying for us or as I'm leading us in prayer. Uh, let's pray together. We'll see some names that we often see, and then there are others that are new to our list, uh, and you keep uh, praying for our sisters and our brothers. Uh, Lord, we continue praying for these uh, who continue to face ongoing uh, physical challenges. We pray for uh, Linda Gowan and for Pat Mitchell. Pray for Gary Lytle and Fran Kirby. Lord, we pray for Larry Settle. We pray for Albert and Hetty and Jim and Barbara, 
Grady and Sandra. Uh, be close to them today and let them know your goodness. Lord, we pray for Oscar Brown and Pete Miller. Pray for Joe Ballinger. Lord, we pray for Susan Parrish. Thank you that she's making progress in the use of her voice, but know that she's got a long way to go. We pray for Kay Ballinger and for Annie Laura. Lord, we pray for continued uh, recovery and uh, rehabilitation for Jane following the, the breaking of a bone. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in nursing home, for Ruby McDowell and Ramona Settle. Pray for Duff Wells and Emory Bishop. We hold up Betty Campbell and Sarah Trout and Doris Wilkins. We pray for Marlene Bradley, Bill Cothran. Pray for Sid Plumley and Henry Whittingham. And Lord, there are those who are grieving today. Some, it's very fresh. Some, it's a few days out, but they're still, they still know the deep, deep pain of grief. We pray for um, Judy Folk's family, for Jessica and for her, uh, her immediate family. Lord, we pray for David Bishop's family. We pray for the family of P.J. Shoemaker. Lord, there's only so much that we can do within our human strength. We can, we can be there for folks and, and we can listen. Uh, but we pray that you will use whatever we're able to do or not do. Uh, we pray that you will use us as your instruments uh, to help heal and to comfort uh, and to strengthen our friends as they work through uh, the dark days of grief. And Lord, we pray for others, uh, for Carol Helton. Uh, thank you for good reports. Pray that you'll continue to strengthen her body. We pray for Scarlett McGuire. Lord, we pray for Rick Sabo, and we, we pray specifically with him for his parents, um, both of whom help this slipping away. Lord, we pray for Max Moon, Lisa LeMaster, for Betsy Beecham. Pray for David. We pray for Betty Rada. Lord, be close to them and uh, hold them up and you know what they're facing. For some, it's physical. For some, it's uh, emotional struggles. Um, just be close to them and, and make sure that uh, they know how much you love them and how much you are working in their lives. And Lord, as we often do in this time, we pray for our church as a whole. We pray that we will be open to your leadership. We pray that we will Always seek to be united around your purpose of loving you and loving others. And we pray, Lord, as you gather us in a few days for worship, that we will honor you first and foremost. As much as we enjoy our fellowship, as we enjoy the time we spend together, uh, it is in that fellowship and in that spending time together that we have the opportunity to unite our hearts and minds and to offer you a gift of worship. And may we approach that time together understanding uh, that there's nothing more significant that we do than to give you our praise and our worship. We seek to do that not just on Sundays when we come together, but every day and every hour. Uh, but in that coming together, we know that is a very, very special time. We thank you for it and pray that we will take full advantage of it uh, to show you uh, our praise. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining with me in this time of study. Uh, again, I encourage you to read the uh, book of Esther and uh, talk to me about it when we see each other. And I hope we see each other soon.